Our next guest is the executive chef of New York's Brasserie Les All and the author of this best selling memoir of his life in the restaurant business entitled Kitchen Confidential. Here's Anthony Bourdain, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the program. Happy to be here. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this book. It was fascinating stuff. It seems like a great, wild, exciting, colorful life, being a chef, being a cook, working in restaurants and stuff. The child's dream of running a pirate crew. Yeah. Now, um, you used to run a restaurant, I had a restaurant right next door to this theater, right? Yeah. It was called, it was called Sullivan's, mm -hmm. and, and you were hoping to cash in on uh, that uh, Ed Sullivan mania. <laughs> <laughs> What, 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 what was the deal? Because everybody thought, well, great, this is nice. We have a nice restaurant here. But what, what happened to that? Yeah, what a concept, an Ed Sullivan theme restaurant. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that wasn't such a good idea, was it? <laughs> but, I mean, it wasn't really a theme restaurant, was it? Uh, yeah, I, I guess. I really, we never figured it out. Was it a nightclub or were we a restaurant? I mean, Ed Sullivan <laughs> is not the first name that comes to mind, you know, rollicking the time and a good meal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, how long was that in business? Uh, I think about two years. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about where, uh, t tell me the story from the book about the time that you first had an oyster. You're a kid, you're in France with your family. Yeah, I was uh, bouncing around France with my family. Actually, they were dragging me around. I was not happy to be there. Right. I was complaining, you know, the butter tastes cheesy, I, this milk <laughs> is strange, I hate this food. Um, and we were invited out on, o on an oyster boat with, with a neighbor and uh, who suddenly reached into the water and pulled one out, cracked one open. And I saw my whole family kind of recoil in horror. <laughs> And I think largely because I realized this is a real opportunity to shock and horrify my family, we're going to give it a shot. Right. And it was great. So you, as a kid, you just really loved it. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was the beginning. That, that a little light went off and you said, maybe I have a life in food here. Food has power to, yeah. to you know, create an impression. And then you spent uh, a lot of time, I don't know, a lot of time, uh, some summers working at a, uh, like a resort restaurant up in Cape Cod. Is that right? Yeah, one of those places. You know, you've, you've been there someplace like at a, you know, a ramshackle seafood restaurant, fried clams, fried shrimp, yeah. you know, French fries, <laughs> uh, diet, you know, light cooking. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, w I was a dishwasher and uh, just a summer job. And I looked over at the cooks, and these guys, they dressed like pirates, they carried big badass knives, they stole everything in sight, they drank for free, they had these incredibly <laughs> prolific social lives, shall we say. Uh-huh, sure. That, yeah. that looked good to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's also another, another moment, I think, when you're working at one of these places, when you had injured yourself uh, working for a, a meal, and you asked a guy if there was, like, a first aid kit, or do you have any uh, ointment or bacitracin lotion or something? Right. Yeah, that's something you don't do in restaurants. Yeah. I mean, I'd, it was my first real job as a cook. I thought I was hot stuff. I'd, I'd worked a little bit in this knucklehead restaurant. And I went into a restaurant where they really knew what they were doing. Uh -huh. It was very busy. And I was in the weeds, as we say, just terribly behind. And I, I burned myself on a hot sizzle platter, one of the things they put under the broiler. And I turned to the guy next to me and said, you know, do you have a Band-Aid? And, <laughs> and uh, it was just the worst moment. Everybody, the whole kitchen went quiet. And the guy says to me, oh, you know, you want a Band-Aid? Reaches under, grabs a sizzle platter, bare hand, puts it down in front of me, looking in my eyes yeah. the whole time. I just, you know, slunk home and, you know, <laughs> thought about it. <laughs> Now, there was, uh, 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 let's talk about eating in, in, in restaurants. In, in New York City, we just were like knee deep in rats. Now, are, are, there rats, are there rats in restaurants in New York City? Not my restaurant. Yeah. Um, there are. I worked in a Mexican place years ago where they, they used to drag, they'd drag avocado pits and chicken bones up in the ceiling. And you'd be working, and suddenly the ceiling would crumble and, and you know, chicken bones and From the rats. avocado they had brought would it come up down. They'd yeah. come scurrying across your feet. I had one. They need poison, curl up on my shoes in the kitchen. <laughs> Horrible. Are they that prevalent? Mm, not that. Now, is, is it possible to have a sanitary kitchen and also have rodents in it? Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Can, can you cook reasonable meals and still have mice and rats and stuff? If there? you save them for stock. Yeah. yeah. You, them. <laughs> you know, there's a, uh, uh, when comedians get together, they, they love nothing more than to talk about times that they have bombed, when they've gone out and for an hour gotten no laughs. Is it, is it the same with cooks and chefs? Do you get together and talk about meals that you really screwed up? Um, I, we're all control freaks. We've all had at least one, probably more, really terrible nights like that. And I think our whole lives are constructed in such a way as to avoid any possibility of that happening. I had one New Year's Eve at a big nightclub years ago that, you know, people who'd ordered at 9.30 at night 
were walking in the kitchen around 12.30, walking themselves in the kitchen, looking behind the line and saying, is, is that my appetizer? <laughs> and the, the waiters were hiding in the kitchen. <laughs> when the kitchen's quiet, you know you're in trouble. Now, if, if there is like a wise guy eating in your restaurant, do you like touch his food and lick the plate and that kind of thing? <laughs> Not a good idea. No, we give them what, what they want, and quickly. <laughs> There's a very funny story in here, and, uh, and my impression from this is that people in your profession go from one job, one restaurant, to another job, to another restaurant, and just make a big swing and a, a, a circle through the, the city and then back again, and they keep doing it over and yeah. over again. And you, you go to a, a, an interview, and it's like a steakhouse. And, and things are going pretty, pretty good, and finally, uh, the owner of the steakhouse asks you one question, and you, you think, well, geez, how exactly do I answer this? And screwed up the whole thing. Do you know what that is? Yeah, the guy had a, a very thick Scottish brogue, and I desperately needed this job, and I was doing so well in the interview, and he says, well, what do you know about me? And I, I'm trying to figure out what does he want me to yeah, say, is it a, trick a flatter question? of yeah, what? Absolutely. I, you know, I said... <laughs> I decided to be honest, next to nothing, I said. Right, right. And, uh, you know, suddenly the interview's over. I'm on my way out the door. I thought, what did I do wrong? And I realized, you know, he runs a steakhouse, and what he really asks is, you know, what do you know about meat? And I, <laughs> not, not the right answer. <laughs> not much. <laughs> Very little about, about what? About meat? No, nothing really. Had so a proud. hamburger or two, that's it. Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about these guys like Emeril Lagasse and those guys on the Food Network? Well, you, you're asking me to, you know, kick Santa Claus in the crotch on television. I mean, <laughs> everybody loves the guy. I'd pay money uh, to see that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, a nice guy who runs great restaurants. I find the show excruciating. And most chefs I know, we, we see it, we want to jump out the window. Mm. Uh, and what about, what about uh, also like the, the Iron Chef, that kind of thing? I don't understand it, but it's cool. Yeah, it is. It's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> Now, if, if, uh, if I would come to your restaurant tonight, uh, or anybody comes to your restaurant tonight, and, and people do come to your restaurant, uh, who, 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 who's cooking their food? Are you cooking their food? Uh, not lately, no. Uh, I think the you best... got a guy who does it. I have a lot of guys to do it. Uh, I, I think the idea from television, people get the idea that, that the people cooking your food are wear starch white jackets, they uh, speak well, uh, they're adorable and cuddly, like Emeril. Um, <laughs> In fact, they're more like a Mexican prison gang. <laughs> you asked. <laughs> well, bon appetit. <laughs> uh, it's a fascinating book. It's doing well, too, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, nice job. Kitchen Confidential, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here. Nice to have you with us. Anthony Bourdain. We'll be right back with Foo Fighters. Thank you so much for coming home. Our next guest is uh, one of America's uh, leading chefs and the star of a new travel channel series entitled No Reservations. Here's Anthony Bourdain, ladies and gentlemen. the program. Good to be here. I have a, a lot of things to talk to you about, but first of all, let's remind people that you once worked here in the same building nearly, didn't you? Uh, yeah, that spot's not having a lot of luck, is it? Well, they got a pretty good pizza place in there now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But yours was, uh, it was based on uh, Ed Sullivan, the life of Ed Sullivan or something? <laughs> that was the restaurant? Not a good theme for a restaurant, <laughs> I don't think, you know. Does Ed Sullivan spell fun and delicious? <laughs> uh, I don't know. What, what was the problem there? Was it the, the, the lease was the problem, the customers, the walk-in? What happened there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> Just didn't work. Uh, but, but since then, you've gone on to become the chef at a uh, wonderful uh, French Leal, yeah. Yeah. And uh, in your life, you've been a professional chef for like 26 years or so? Yeah, about, uh, I spent the first 28 years of my working life standing up in a small closet-like mm -hmm. uh, space, one, you know, one, one or the other, uh, all over New York. I've right. seen very little of the world too recently. And, and also a very accomplished uh, author, best-selling books, Kitchen Confidential, on and on and on. Yeah. And, and will eat anything. Look at this guy, yeah. Paul. Is there an ounce of fat on the man? There is not. You're yeah. right. It's th as thin as a rail. I saw a, uh, a p part of the new show where you're in uh, North Vietnam and you're, you're eating porcupine. Yeah. 
and, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, it's got to be horrible. How can uh, it not be horrible? Uh, bless it was like porcupine of indeterminate age. You know, right. the, the restaurant was closed when we arrived, and we were with somebody from the interior ministry who flashed a card. Suddenly they opened, and I'm looking at this thing. And, it really looked like roadkill. I was relieved, in fact, that, that, that it was porcupine. At least it was identifiable <laughs> meat, you know? And w what did it taste like? Um, not like chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, somewhere between, you know, a turtle and cat food, you know? Was it... <laughs> Now, now, when I when I watch you on these shows, you always make it look like you're the luckiest man alive to be eating this this wonderful indigenous presentation. But you you must run across stuff that's just god awful, right? Uh, I was just in Iceland uh, for the show, and I ate. They eat uh, once a year. They have a big uh, sort of a traditional festival called Toroblot, where they eat putrefied shark. That is, they, they let it rot, and then they marinate it in lye or lactic acid for six months. And this is six a, months. This is a, <laughs> Like, it wasn't bad enough already. It was six months. Um, and I will tell you, it is the single worst thing I have ever eaten in my life. And that, this is me talking, so that's, I've eaten live reptile parts, so this, that's saying a lot. And, and what about it do the Icelanders enjoy? Um, I think it's sort of a rite of passage celebrating earlier, harder times. I, I don't think a lot of them like it. I mean, they handle it with rubber gloves or, and pick it up with toothpicks so they don't even touch it. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really nasty. You know, if... If you think back on your childhood goldfish that died like 35 years ago, if you were to revisit them now and take a big bite out of them, uh, that like would that. pretty much reproduce the same textural flavor experience, right, I think. Right. But the, the truth of it is, the human organism can pretty much eat anything, can't it? Uh, yeah, just about. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever had food poisoning when you're traveling doing these shows? Um, I violated every known traveler's warning of what you're not supposed to eat under any circumstance. Generally, if I'm a good guest. If locals are eating it or drinking it, I'll, I'll do what I'm... I feel very lucky to, to visit these countries and be treated well. Um, the only time I've been desperately ill was in my ancestral uh, homeland of France. I just broke down and after, <laughs> you know, too much rich food. Uh, you know, just every once in a while you spin the wheel and you lose. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, my producers love nothing more than, than shooting me, catching me like curled up in a fetal position uh -huh. on a cold tile floor. <laughs> they think that's video gold. Now, uh, on, on the, the old show and then now on the new show, I notice we see quite a lot of you drinking and smoking. Yeah, well, that's how I keep my girlish figure. It's, you know. <laughs> but you consume a great quantity of the local spirits, it seems like. You're not making friends in the world if you, if you don't keep up. Uh, I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm a good guest. You know, you, you go to Russia and, the, for instance, where it's really tough to, to, to keep up, uh, all of this, the toasts are personal. You know, it's like, this is to our, you know, glorious countries. This is to our homelands. This is to the spirit of international cooperation. This is to our mothers. What are you going to do? Say, well, you know, the hell with your mother, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sit this one out. It right. doesn't work, does you, it? I try to keep up. Yeah. Uh, now, in, in, the, in the terms of, uh, I, I think you eat different kinds of food than, than I would order in a restaurant. If I were to go into, like, your restaurant, what would be the most, for me, unusual dish I might consume? Like, like, do you have sweet breads in there? We have sweet breads. We have uh, pig's feet. Uh, now, pig's feet, how are those prepared? Uh, all the bones are taken out. They're, they're essentially stewed till they're tender. Uh, all the bones are taken out. Then they're uh, spread with a little mustard, breadcrumbs, Are they sauce. tasty? Yeah, yeah, they're good. Yeah. And, and, and the sweet breads, that's uh, cow brains? Uh, thymus glands. Oh, thymus glands. Mm. <laughs> they're glandy delicious. No kidding. I always thought sweet breads were the, the brains. What no. are the brains called? Uh, brains. <laughs> <laughs> And, well, how do you prepare the thymus glands? Uh, light dusting of flour, saute in a hot pan with butter. They're delicious. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. But, I mean, uh, almost anything would be delicious prepared that way, wouldn't it? Um, I, you know, I think you're going you're to find that, that, that most chefs uh, love that stuff after work. And mm -hmm. for, for their, you know, it's to their own taste. We get bored with steak and lobster, and, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a, a real cook to, you know, coax flavor and texture out of a hoof or snout. <laughs> Yes, sir. Now, it seems like just a few years ago there was uh, one or two television chefs. There was Julia Child, and then maybe you had Jacques Pepin, and, yeah. and then that seemed like to be pretty much the run of the mill as far as TV chefs go. And now they're just everywhere, for God's sakes. Yeah, it's, they're they're popping up everywhere, aren't are, they? Are, are they are these truly world ca class uh, chefs that we see on television? Uh, some of them. I mean, I, you know, I may not like Emerald's show, but the guy's a real chef. I mean, he he's worked in the business forever. He paid his dues. Uh, guys like Mario Batali, uh, that's a real chef. Mm -hmm. 
you know, they, I, some of these creatures, like the one on, the, the one who has the show where, you know, apparently they show you how, how to take, you know, a two-week-old box of Triscuits, some cheese whiz, and some, uh, you know, some Cool Whip, and you can feed your family, and, and they'll lose weight. Uh, and is lose that a, weight. Wow. Yeah, is that a chef? You know, uh, Rachel Ray, cute, but is that a chef? Oh, but she's know, hot. I, I so. am very fond of Rachel Ray. <laughs> about her because she travels all over eating uh, $40 a day and your point about spending $40 anybody can spend $40 yeah. a day on food if if you stiff every waiter in town That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the traveling deadbeat you know it's like tip lady <laughs> but she's very very cute uh, and so anyway the new show give us an idea where you're going we know you're in Vietnam we know you're going to Iceland you know you're going to Russia where what other locations I uh, just got back from Uzbekistan mm -hmm. uh, let's see uh, Vietnam uh, was Vegas. it Borneo Borne Las Vegas Bor Borneo yeah w with actual man-eaters is that correct uh, my host I stayed in a long house in the jungle uh, with these heavily tattooed uh, Dayak dudes who uh, though some of the older generations still have tattoos on their fingers mm -hmm. Uh, indicating that uh, they lopped off heads back in the day. Wow. And in fact, uh, I ate dinner in the longhouse with the tribe, what were and they, they, they had a big little bouquet of skulls over there. Is that right? Yeah. Now, was that just for show, or that really is no, no, that's, artifacts uh, of their they're, ancestry? They're their serious, heritage. They're of recent memory in some cases. Is that right? Um, it's, it's food folks and fun out there. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> sim simple cuisine, but. Now, how do these guys decide who they'll eat? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, who makes that decision? Uh, I don't know. They were. They were. Couldn't have been nicer to, uh, to yeah. me. They were. They were. I was, <laughs> I was grateful for that. Guess what we're having for dinner tonight, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> That's just awful. Uh, well, I'm fascinated uh, by, by uh, the show and also your uh, books and uh, your restaurant. Uh, the show is called No Reservations. Monday at 10 on the Travel Channel. Where the hell is the Travel Channel? <laughs> Uh, again, I think in, well, here it's on like 88, something 88. like that. Well, well worth searching around the dog. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, ladies and gentlemen, always a pleasure. Thank you for being here, sir. We'll be right back, everybody. I used to do a thing where I would take off all my clothes and I would uh, sit on a piece of cheese and then, then you, you swallow a live mouse. But that's a different... That's a different... That's a different... Totally different. That's a different... Yeah, that uh, has nothing to do with this. No. No. Uh, our next guest uh, stars on a popular travel channel series entitled uh, No Reservations. Please welcome Anthony Bourdain. This show, I guess you've been doing it for about five years, in, in one form or another, where you travel around the world to exotic places and you sample the, the food, the cuisine, and the life of these areas. And, 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 and I've seen you eat some things, and I just wonder, uh, do, do, you, do you get sick? Do you get hepatitis? Do you throw up? Do you, <laughs> have you ever been really ill? Uh, only two times in about, uh, in 40 years, only two times. Is Once that in, right? in France, of all places. What were you eating in France? At, uh, on you? Just, uh, you know, too much too much of a good thing. Another time, uh, <laughs> the business end of a, of, well, let's put it this way, sanitation in the Kalahari is not a premium, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're eating the business end of a warthog. And, a war uh, really, a warthog? Uh, not good. Sand, yeah. fur, and yeah. crap in every bite. Uh, that, that was not good. But most of the time, if I find myself kind of on a cold tile floor after a meal uh, on the show, most of the time it's alcohol related. I see. Uh, well. <laughs> Well, good, I can rest assured now. Uh, but is it, is it true, and I guess I, I, I've, uh, I have this impression from watching your show, that humans pretty much can eat anything. Is that about right? Uh, pr pretty much. Uh, you know, uh, again, I wouldn't recommend, I don't know, I'm not a Chicken McNugget fan, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, those things will kill you. Hello! Um, and I didn't see this show, but I think I saw it in a promo where uh, it was a, a snake, they cut the heart out of a, a cobra. How did they do it? Where was that? It's uh, in Vietnam. I've come to dread the, the phrase, something very special, as yeah. in Mr. Bourdain, we have something very special for yes. you. That, that usually means there's, you know, something still living or mm -hmm. 
you know, living not too long ago. It, it's a table side dish, and they, they bring the cobra by, and they let them kind of strike at you and hiss, and then they <laughs> zip them open with a pair of gardening shears, and a little heart drops into a plate, and you eat it, and it is, in fact, beating all the way down. It's beautiful. beautiful. Whoa. Whoa. But, uh, I mean, did you, do you swallow it? Do you chew it? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, it's kind of a one bite. It's like eating a very athletic, angry oyster. <laughs> An athletic oyster. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, and and in, uh, you say Vietnam is considered a delicacy, or is that something? Yeah, it's they have not all an every. Time? It's not an everyday dish. Yeah, something but, uh, special, you like know, you said. No honored guest. Um, you know, it's it's kind of an early. You know, it's supposed to put you in the mood and uh, you know, cause see. many many sons. Ooh, wow! Uh, so speaking of that, had a child, not a son, but a little girl. Is that correct? I'm a, I'm a new first time. Well, dad. congratulations, I'm Steve. It. Thank How you. old is the girl? She's uh, 11 months, and I've just I've recently discovered the, the unholy supernatural powers of Elmo. I don't know whether you've noticed this. Mm. You know, it's like hitting her with a stun gun. She calms really? right down, love, loves that, to sit mm -hmm. there mesmerized by him. I have this kind of recurring nightmare that I, I wake up and I go into the living room and she's there watching Rachel Ray with the same blissed out look on her uh -huh. face, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, stop. <laughs> But now this brings up a, an interesting question, and I know it's a, a, occurred to you. Uh, a lot of times, kids go through phases, and sometimes not just a phase, but they just become picky or difficult eaters. And you eat anything, but and you want your daughter to eat anything yeah, too, right? This child will never know what a grilled cheese sandwich with a crust cut off is. Her, she will soon be on a first name basis with every sushi chef in Manhattan. Uh. It'll be <laughs> Uncle Masa, Uncle Yasuda. Um, <laughs> And, you know, mom's Italian uh, and uh, already, you know, getting, a, I'm not kidding, you know, prosciutto flavored baby food sent over. Really? So. Oh, well, that's nice. This will not be, you know, a, a happy but weird child, I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> well, that's all you can hope for. But uh, um, <laughs> you, you, uh, I remember reading one of your books where you, you, you started out working as everybody does in that business, in, in these uh, sweatshop-like restaurants, mm -hmm. uh, t tourist places up on uh, uh, Cape Cod. Was that yeah. what it was? Uh -huh. now, do you ever, could you go back and do that again? Uh, you know, it's funny. I went back uh, recently. I, I, I get a lot of grief from old, old friends who are still chefs, and they say, you know, you've been doing this for the TV thing for a long time now. Uh, you know, you're past it. You know, you've lost all your credibility. You, 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 you know, do you even cook anymore? Mm. So I thought, well, you know what, I'll go back to my old restaurant and I'll work my old double Tuesday shift where I'd work from 8 o'clock in the morning till midnight. What I kind of neglect, and, and I'll film it, you know, mm -hmm. for television. You know, really bad idea because the restaurant, the kitchen is the same size, but the, the dining room has doubled in size. <laughs> it's eight years later. I'm 51 years old. Fortunately, however, I thought if, if I'm going to suffer, I, I, it, it's always better to have someone you know suffer along with you and maybe even worse. So I invited uh, Eric Repair, who's the chef of Le Bernardin, to, uh, no, I, to I, join I, me. Le, le, and you don't need to, to I don't need to tell, but this guy, you ever eaten in that place? Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Oh, my, I've had, I, I've had uh, the three great meals in my life. They've all been at that restaurant. He's a great, great chef. It's a civil, he's never worked in anything but like a three-star, very refined, beautiful yeah. kitchen. So here he the is. The thing working. this guy does, I don't mean to interrupt, yeah. but this Eric Repair, uh, the thing he does is with the aerosol cheese. Have you tried that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, here, Leal, where, where, where I worked, was it's a turn and burn steakhouse. It does, you know, 385, 500 meals. And uh, so I, and, and plus, you, as you know, he he's largely works with seafood, so I thought it would be really funny to throw him into this busy mosh pit kitchen. Um, and, uh, you know, put them on the grill station. And uh, so we, we ended up having a lot of fun. Did it work out pretty well? It must have been exhausting. I, it's I exhausting made it even when you were a kid. Yeah. I made it through the night, I, but uh, I woke up the next day feeling it, and any notion I might have, I might have about going back to it, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding myself. Now, the, the, the other thing that I've gained from watching the show is that one message, if, if any other message, it's that uh, you should eat more organ meat. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody, you know, you, you, you can really... Train a reasonably intelligent bonobo monkey to grill a steak or, or, or boil a lobster. <laughs> it takes really, uh, and I have. 
Um, <laughs> but you got to get in there. I mean, for example, sweetbreads again, what, is it the That's thalamus th gland? The thymus gland. Th yeah, thymus I, gland. I think most chefs really love that stuff, you know, the shanks and shoulders mm -hmm. and the, the tough bits, uh, the squiggly bits, because it really takes some craft and some, some magic right. to, to make and, and, and that And that was it when, when uh, the relationship of uh, humans to food was more than just a, a nice time out. I mean, it was essential. You had to use all of the animal. Yeah, I mean, that's where the real cooking is. And, and you know, you know where your, your, your food comes yeah. from then. It's not this shrink wrapped kind of hygienic stuff. The, uh, the show, Mondays at 10 a.m., is a huge uh, hit for the uh, Travel Channel. It's Anthony Bourdain, No Reservations. Good to see you again. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. is a uh, star of a, it's a new travel channel series entitled The Layover. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Anthony Bourdain. Everyone, the enigmatic Anthony Bourdain. How's it going? You know what I mean? Good. Anthony, how much do you weigh? <laughs> 196. 196. And you look like you're about 6'4", like, or something like that? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that's pretty good. Uh, whenever I see your show, the uh, No Reservation, I'm worried because uh, it's not like you have a meal. You have three or maybe four meals and then snacks every uh, show. And I think, how can this guy not be jeopardizing his health? I mean, are you in good shape? What's your cholesterol? Um, <laughs> not so good. Not so good. Yeah. <laughs> and are, are you still... Uh, no, cut, cut, down on the, cut down on the cigarettes. Yeah. I managed to quit that over right. a few years ago. And do, do you exercise? Do you work out? Mm, i got to get to that one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> no. Now, the other thing is that you're always gone. You're never home. I mean, how many days of the year are you out traveling, shooting your program? Between the show and speaking gigs, about 240 days a year. 240 days a year. That's, that, a, that's a lot of time in airports. Yeah. Now, do you, do you like that? I have the best job in the world, so... Uh, as long as it's fun, I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. But you have a little uh, girl at home. How old is she? Four years She's, old? She's uh, about four and a half. Four now. and a half years old. Now, I do you get to take her with you on the show? You'll notice a, suspic a suspiciously high number of shows in Italy, where my wife's from, uh, Western Europe, where my in laws can come can and all be yeah. together. So <laughs> well, well, that's I try great. to plan destinations around. <laughs> no, if you can do that, that's a lovely yeah. thing. And, you, and now you have a, a second show, and I'm thinking, well, you're, what do you, I mean, come on. I'm milking this. <laughs> I'm milking the celebrity chef thing for everything I can <laughs> but get out of But do you out. realize how, how many people, how many sad, sad cases of people who only have one show? <laughs> do you, are you aware of that? <laughs> it's tragic. It's pathetic. Now, I watched the, uh, the uh, layover show today, and to me, it's the same as the other show. Explain to me the difference between no reservations and layover. <laughs> Well, no reservations. It's more about me, me, me having fun, and whether other people can replicate the experience or not. I don't really care. You know, it's all about me. Yeah. Uh, layover is is uh, we're trying anyway to be useful. Meaning these are places, uh, uh, destinations that you can. Actually so well, you're go. in Malaysia. It was Singapore when I saw the yeah. show, and you, you get a, a 24 plus hours in Singapore. So yeah. What do you do? You go to this tremendous, huge food court food market kind of place where it had a million different kinds of cuisine and a million different kinds of stuff. Was it all good? Their street food is maybe the best in the world. You get the mm -hmm. most variety and the, mo the highest number of places. Uh, you know, it's good, cheap, delicious, and probably good for you. Yeah. And, and why, and, and compare it to what? To compare it to the United States, compare it to New York. Our street food compared to their street food? <laughs> really? I mean, you know, I love meat on a stick, but <laughs> you, you tend to pay a price for it yeah. here. <laughs> it's just the street gyros, you know, I can't, I can't stay away from them. I know, you know, it's, that's going to be some extra time on the Thunder Bucket, but, <laughs> but well worth it. <laughs> um, and, and why, in a place like Singapore, would the quality of food be better than it is here in this country? Because everything else is illegal. They run a very strict society, very, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Everything, including what? Is he no drugs? Uh, no, no, no drugs littering. Are, yeah, no littering. Littering, no. Um, you know, I think even like some television shows that we take for granted that we consider pretty mild stuff. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. No go over there. Yeah. Uh, now here, here's the thing that has been stuck up my nose for the last ten years. 
And you, you're the guy to help me out with. We have, we have uh, two 24-hour-a-day food networks. Yes. Talking about, oh, look how much fun it is to prepare food. Look at how much fun it is to eat food. Look at a dozen different ways to prepare the same thing. We have two, two networks, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now you also have uh, shows where it's guys who are going to uh, cake wars. And they're going to, oh, I, I can uh, b build a cake that looks like a Jeep. Okay, build a cake <laughs> that looks like... Yeah. And, and then you have the, uh, the cupcake wars. And, and, and then you have the, la the top chef or the, the bottom chef or the last chef. or <laughs> On and on yeah. and on and on. And this is all well and good, except for the fact that in the world there's a hundred million people starving. So how how do we justify the commerce that is generated off gluttony with the yeah. fact that a hundred million people in the world are starving? Well, you know where I draw the line is you know you see someone on TV making uh, you know a bacon cheeseburger with an egg on top between two Krispy Kreme donuts. I just right. you know. Have we crossed the line? Is this something America needs right now? No, no, no. Um, and and, and it's something. Now, I, what I wonder about are all of the, like your show, for example. A certain amount of your, your profits go to the World Food Program or something like that, or like the Food Channel. Did the, did they take this into consideration? Uh, no, actually, I spend all the money on uh, crack cocaine and you know, <laughs> shiny new cars. No. Shiny <laughs> new cars. No. But the uh, <laughs> crack cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I and mean, you we, went, we, you, at least we, we come with a parental advisory, which, I mean, I do a lot of unhealthy stuff on my show, but I'm not, you know, I think some, maybe perhaps some of these other right. shows would be a good idea to... Well, they get that one guy who travels around and uh, says, okay, today we, we got a meatloaf the size of this desk. You have 20 oh. minutes to eat it. What do they think of this show in Afghanistan? Uh, well, that's that, what I'm you know? talking about. Yeah. There are people in this world to, to keep their stomachs full are e actually, actually eating dirt. And then this guy's, all right, bring it on. And then they wheel in this thing on a gurney, and Tubby sits down and goes crazy. Well, you know, <laughs> why do people watch this show? I don't know why. I'll tell you why. You want to, I think it, they're watching it for the same people, same reason that people go to see Siegfried and Roy. You know, you, you, you want someone to die. <laughs> You, you figure today's the day he's going to choke on that burger. <laughs> you want to be there when the guy pitches forward. When the into tiger his, takes a bite out of a German. It, yeah. His, uh, <laughs> hey. Germans, come on. Lighten up a little bit. <laughs> now, will you, do, do you find it a, a day will you ever go back to actually chefing again? Are you done chefing? Um, I hope it, I don't have to go back to brunch, but it's always a possibility. Brunch. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'd be much use uh, in the well, kitchen. Why was this. brunch the problem? Um, you know, no matter how low things were in my life, how desperate, how unlovely my personal habits at the time, I knew I could always get a brunch gig. So for me, brunch was always, <laughs> the, the smell of, of failure was French toast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't go wrong with Eggs Benedict either, for God's sake. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's a brand new show. It's called The Layover. You can see it beginning November 21st at 9. Now, will that follow? Uh, no reservations? In between. In, in between. Yeah, I mean, we're going to no stop. Reservations, no reservations. The layover. No, yeah. uh, good for you. Anthony Bourdain, ladies and gentlemen. Good Thank to see you. you. Thank good you. Good to see you. We'll be right back with Joan Baez and Chris Christopherson, everybody. I can't know you, baby, cry.